Let's look together in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we ask this morning that as your word has been read and now is to be preached, that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would bless us with insight and wisdom, guide us, and we ask that too, that we would hear the word with joy. Speak to us today, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Although we, we read Romans as a book, it's important for us to remember its genre. It's important for us to remember that it is, in fact, a letter. And, at the most basic level, we should read it as it was written. A case in point, as we work our way through Romans, I want to encourage you to be reading Romans and It is a rather short letter, and so you can read it in one sitting. And I think it's important because it gives us perspective, and it helps us to understand the flow of the argument. But, because we are preaching the way, my way through Romans, we cannot do all of the chapters of the book, and so we look at it in part. Now, in, in substance, it is, of course, more than a letter. Let us be clear, it is the very Word of God. And so we read it, and we we study it intently, even intricately, to glean God's special revelation and to know His will. So rich and deep is the divine truth of God's Word. We dare not rush our way through it. But we diligently look at it, verse by verse. And none of this changes its form, however. It's a letter. So when Paul asked the question, such as in our passage today, has God rejected his people? It's imperative that we stop and we understand the overall flow of the letter. We cannot read that question in isolation. If we do, It can lead to a myriad of complications in understanding Romans as a whole. For example, if we were to go back just to the ninth chapter, just to the ninth chapter, Paul in the ninth chapter laments Israel's rejection of Christ. But it's a lamentation that trusts the sovereignty of God. As God is sovereign, Paul is confident that all who have been predestined will be saved. And uniting this with Paul's concern for Israel, he, in that ninth chapter, makes the distinction that, and I quote, 
not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. You may recall it's a distinction between natural Israel and spiritual Israel. And the salvation of the elect. While Paul's distinction between the natural and spiritual Israel is hard to understand, God's sovereign purpose will prevail. And that's the point. It will prevail in the salvation of the elect. Why he will do this is his sovereign prerogative. How he will do this is according to his sovereign means of appointment. And God has appointed that he will save his elect through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Understanding this, one might presume then that God has rejected Israel for their rejection of Christ. And that's a fair presumption. But we have to ask ourselves, is it accurate? And looking at it in context, has God in fact rejected Israel because they rejected Christ? Paul says, by no means. Paul submits himself as a living, breathing example, doesn't he? He says, for I myself, that redundancy, for I myself am an Israelite. Paul explains, by birth, he wasn't a Gentile, but a descendant of Abraham. He was not a child of Esau, but a child of Jacob. In fact, he says of Jacob, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. So if God rejected Israel, how could an Israelite like Paul be saved through faith in Christ? In a sense, Paul's point is this. If God saves one child of Israel, then he has not rejected Israel. Of course, the confusion comes, and here's where it gets very confusing for some. The confusion comes with the assumption that the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob flow unequivocally to all of the natural descendants of Israel. But Paul's example, I myself, he says, Paul's example is helpful here too. As an Israelite and also a professing Christian, he is the exception a believing minority in a land of unbelievers. A child of Israel by nature, a child of God by faith. Indeed, Israel was a people chosen by God. Let's not miss this. Scripture is very clear. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, Moses declared this to the assembly, or we would say Jesus, that Moses declared this to the Old Testament church. Quote, The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession, out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. No other nation could claim that. It could only be said of Israel. And as Paul pointed out, When he said this in chapter 9 about his kinsmen of the flesh, his kinsmen, he says, they are, quote, Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ. And yet, despite all of that, All of that favor did not mean a guarantee of eternal salvation. Only faith in Christ can do that. Only those whom God foreknew believe. Or here's the way that John Calvin put it. 
He said, the fruit of adoption does not exist in all the children of the flesh. For secret election precedes. In other words, God has not rejected those whom he foreknew. And to explain this, again, I keep referring to the ninth chapter, but we need to understand it in context. In the ninth chapter, Paul quotes from the prophet Isaiah. And he says, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Israel's rejection of Christ does not necessitate God's rejection of Israel. It's, it's like, as was read earlier today, it, it's like Elijah's low point on the Mount of Horeb. He was fearful to death of the death threat of Jezebel. And he was disheartened by the lack of the visible faithfulness of Israel. He looked out upon the land and he could see no one who was faithful to the Lord. And Elijah made this, and it was a wrong assumption. He assumed he was the last believer in the land. Even leading him to pray to the Lord, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. In a nation known, defined as God's people, Elijah could only see when he looked out the blind, the deaf, and the cursed. But God, who preserves his elect, God knew better. Do you remember what he said to Elijah? Paul tells us right here in our passage. Look at verse 4. I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. As God revealed to Elijah in the Old Testament, so God reveals to the Apostle Paul, at the present time, there is a remnant, Paul tells us. And what's the defining characteristic of that remnant? They are chosen by grace. And so Paul asks this question, what then? What happened? Maybe even as far as saying, what's the status of Israel? In short, look at verse 7. Israel, not all, but as a whole, failed to obtain what it was diligently seeking. But to understand this, we need to ask a few questions. And I want you to engage with me as I ask these questions. I want you to think about them. The first question is, What specifically did Israel fail to obtain? If they failed to obtain something, what was it? What did they specifically fail to obtain? Well, Paul has already told us that, actually. He told us that they have failed to obtain the righteousness of God. That's a pretty important thing, to fail to obtain, right? They have failed to obtain the righteousness of God. Why? Why have they failed? Well... In chapter 9, Paul tells us that it is because they pursued it through the works of the law, not by faith. Not by faith. And you may say, well then surely when Christ came, that changed everything, didn't it? Did Christ come and correct their failed pursuit? No. Israel as a whole was hardened. They were spiritually blind. They were spiritually deaf. They were spiritually cursed. Just as Paul says, it depends not on will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. And just as Paul has said previously, he hardens whomever he will, so God hardened Israel. Paraphrasing Isaiah and Deuteronomy, Paul says of Israel in our passage, look at verse 8, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. The the testimony of God's grace was given to Israel. Think about it. They were children of Abraham who was justified as righteous through faith. 
all the way down to the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But a spirit of stupor, or you could translate that, a spirit of insensibility kept them as a whole from believing. Think about this in Jesus' ministry, and you know this well. How often did Jesus introduce his teaching with, He who has ears, let him hear. Or how often did Jesus teach with parables intentionally because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. You may recall that Jesus, quoting Isaiah, said of Israel as a whole, you will indeed hear but never understand and you will indeed see but never perceive. So the Apostle Paul And our passage then translates from King David. King David's plea for vengeance, Paul translates to judgment. A pronouncement of judgment. In which in verse 9, Paul says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. God's blessing on Israel became a snare, his revelation a trap, his Messiah a stumbling block, his mercy a retribution. And such a pronouncement of judgment is reminiscent of God's word to Israel in Malachi, in which God pronounced judgment upon Israel's priest, in which he said, quote, if you will not listen, If you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. God indeed blessed Israel, but such a blessing did not lead them to repentance and faith but a works-based religion and ultimately a rejection of Christ. Cursed indeed. As it was for Israel, so it is for everyone who is blessed by God, shown favor by God, and yet does not trust in Christ as their Savior. I mean, think about this with me in a New Covenant context. We have the blessings that we enjoy within the church, in the New Covenant Church. We enjoy the blessing of the sign and seal of God's covenant of grace in baptism. We enjoy communion with God and one another in the Lord's Supper. We have a, think about it, we have a complete canon of Scripture to be read and meditated upon, and preached. And God has given us the blessing of the Lord's day, that we may assemble in worship and rest from our labors. All of these, and I could go on and on and on of the blessings that we enjoy in the New Covenant Church, all of these blessings and so much more are blessings from the Lord. And yet, if we reject the significance of our baptism, and its signif- the significance of our baptism, if we eat and drink without examination, if we disregard the revealed will of God, if we forsake the assembling for ease and entertainment, what does this say about the condition of our heart? Shall we receive the blessings of God without knowing, as Malachi taught, that blessings become curses apart from the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ? and obedience to His commands. Do we not already see evidence of this in our own country where we are reaping the harvest of decade after decade after decade of cultural Christianity where we want to see a certain morality within our culture and yet we completely ignore the necessity of conversion, the necessity of believing the gospel. gospel. Even so, God has always preserved a remnant. Those chosen, believing, and saved. God has always preserved a remnant. Though Paul was an Israelite, 
God did not reject him. Though he was a natural descendant of Abraham, God preserved him through faith. Though he was a member of the tribe of Benjamin, God foreknew him. And what do we know of those whom God has foreknown? Those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And Paul was not alone, but he was part of a remnant chosen by grace. In writing to the Ephesians, Paul explains to them what he had already known personally. When he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Otherwise, Paul says in our passage today, grace would no longer be grace. If you change the definition of grace... It ain't grace anymore, right? And this gospel truth, this gospel truth formed a chasm between Paul and his kinsmen. By God's unmerited favor alone, Paul believed the gospel, transforming his works-based religion of self-glory to grace of the gospel to the glory of God. For it is God's sovereign grace that separates the remnant from the whole. And this truth puts the focus squarely where it belongs. Off of us and what we can do for God and on what God has done for us and is doing. Too often, American Christians, in their commingling of church and state, lament what they presume to be the demise of the church as they witness the erosion of Christian values within our culture. I've lost count the number of posts that I have read on the demise of the church in America. Maybe you have too. But it is not only an improper commingling It's an absolutely false deduction, and it's inappropriate, and we should not engage in such lamentation. Don't let your assumption of lost Christian values lead you to think the same thing of Christ's church. Calvin says this, hear this loud and clear. Calvin says, the church, which may not appear as anything to our sight, is nourished by the secret providence of God. For God has a way accessible to himself but concealed from us, by which he wonderfully preserves his elect, even when all seems lost. (laughs) Christian, rest assured, as it says in the word of God, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Furthermore, we need not strive to solve what we perceive to be a problem by either, on the one hand, trying to make the church more like the world. Maybe we can make this just a little more appealing to the world, a little more worldly. Or the opposite extreme of reactionarily hiding in isolation from the world. If we can just get away from the world, hide up in the mountains somewhere and get away from all of these people, Maybe that's the answer. I always like to remind them, wherever you go, you're there. Hmm. Furthermore, we need to strive to solve, uh, or rather we need to think about this. In this bad theology of what I call the theology of self-preservation, where we only think about me, 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 my preservation, not about anybody else, and all of this idea of self-preservation, we need to remember this. And the example of Elijah is as good as any. If you remember the account in 1 Kings of Elijah, on the one hand, Elijah stood alone when he mocked Baal's prophets and fire rained down from heaven upon the altar. 
But on the other hand, he was not really alone when God revealed to him, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Because God love, loves his church, you and I, for the love of God, must continue to worship faithfully. Fellowship regularly. Encourage one another consistently before a watching world. Becoming more worldly or hiding out will not do. I love the way James Boyce puts this. He says, that is what the church is to be after all. The company of those who are living for God and encouraging one another to live for Him even in this present evil world. Christian, rest assured, there is always a remnant chosen by grace. Finally, let us rejoice and give thanks to God's for his, for, to God for His steadfast love and faithfulness. Let us contemplate, let us meditate upon, let us not forget that our Heavenly Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. It, is in, it was in love that He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. And so I ask you, how can we who are predestined for adoption, how can God reject us? He cannot. He will not. This is true of Jew and Gentile alike. He will not forsake his church. God has always had a people preserved and preserving, set apart and sustained, a chosen race of royal priests, a holy people possessed by God, not blind nor deaf, and never cursed, but chosen, believing, and saved. A remnant saved by grace. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we thank you that we, your people, have not been saved by our works, but by your grace alone, that we might direct all praise, all honor, all glory to you. And we thank you for this high privilege on this Lord's Day that we can gather together as your people and praise you. We pray now that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for the celebration of the sacrament. We pray that you would be glorified and that the gospel would be preached through this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.